Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'll be your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from across Canada to learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe on this show, the best way to understand a community is to actually talk to the people who live and work there. Shocking. So that's why we are so honored to have our guest on to the show today. Please help me welcome Councillor Ben Gronberg of the town of Devon in the province of Alberta. Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Ben, let's get the first question out of the way. And if you've listened to the show, you know what it is. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, at a uh, a young age, I you know started getting volunteer. I started volunteering right away um, with children's groups and eventually with my local youth group. And I think at the beginning of these uh, different um, opportunities, they kind of taught me the importance of serving and cooperation and getting involved. Um, Throughout that, I then started, uh, uh, I lifeguarded at the local outdoor pool and I started getting more involved in politics through that. I um, found different ways of avenues with um, volunteering through uh, the, um, when I started going to nursing school, um, I started, um, I got involved in our um our student council and uh, got involved in the youth count or the student council at my high school as well. And so I think I just realized from an early age that um, it's important to get involved. It's important to get involved and have your voice be heard. And so I thought that, uh, um, you know, town council is the next step and, and I was fortunate enough to get elected. Was politics discussed as a child growing up around the dinner table or was politics something or and when I ask politics, I mean municipal politics, because we all know federal and provincial politics is discussed. I want to get to the crux of why did you choose municipal politics and was it discussed as an early age for you? And that's where your interest came from. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a very fair question. Municipal politics is maybe of the less talked about politics in a way. Um, I was like at a young age, I was like super fascinated with politics. Um, I can probably earlier, but I can even remember like as young as like nine or 10, just, you know, wanting to watch CBC, the national and, and learn about the politics of my community and, and my province um, and my country. And I think, you know, my parents probably had more issues with that than than I did, but I always found it really fascinating listening and hearing and being a part of it. Um, municipal politics maybe wasn't necessarily the most um, part that I engaged the most with, and that's partly why I felt there was a need to get more involved in it, was because I think as a younger generational uh, person myself, I think it's important that young people do get involved. Um, that was one of my key platform issues when I ran was I really wanted the youth to be heard. I wanted the youth to have a voice in our community, in our politics, um, and recognize that you know municipal politics are the most accessible politics. Um, and I think that's you know I feel like many municipal politicians that you've probably talked with have probably said the same kind of line. But I really, really believe that um, that municipal politics we're right there. We live in the community. The decisions that we make are the ones that affect us as well. And so there's a personal aspect, of course, to it. And um, the neighbors, the the residents, um, they're all very personal. So I think those those issues, they hit home closer to home, for sure. And so um, municipal politics became a natural avenue because it uh, was the most accessible. Um, my one of my actually one of the councillors who sits um, who got elected at the same time as me, um, Councillor Fisher, she uh, was actually mayor uh, when I was a teenager. And uh, I remember how engaged she was with youth. And she that was one of her priorities too, was youth. And it did make me feel included and special when she would come up and talk to me. And I wanted to pass that along and do my part as a younger person to make sure that I could do that too. So I'm going to ask the semi-million dollar question here because you're talking about youth. Do you mind me asking how old you are when you were elected in 2021? Yeah, I was uh, 25 years old, um, and so it was actually just a few days. I actually got the chance to vote on my birthday, and then a few days after, um, then it was found out that I got elected. So, <laughs> so I want to. 
as I've been doing this show, I'm hearing from stories uh, from your generation, because I can say that because I'm much older than you, and I feel really weird talking to a 25-year-old uh, asking this question, but more young people are getting involved municipally. And while there are some who are getting elected provincially and federally, municipally is where you're seeing that big generational change. When you decided to put your name forward in 2021 to run in your first election in the town of Devon, was there something in the back of your mind that said, you know what, I need to do it because like you said, I need to bring that youth perspective. But at the same time, in the back of your head, you're saying, am I too young? Are people going to look at me and think I'm just a kid off the street looking to get elected? What was the balance like for you making that decision of running in 2021 as a young person? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, a year before the election, I uh, had started hearing conversations around Edmonton, um, the municipal election there about, you know, the mayoral candidates and, and such. And I, I realized, you know, a lot of these candidates are of the older generation. And it made me think, you know, about my own community in Devon. We're so close. So, of course, we're influenced by Edmonton. But um, I started thinking about my own community and I started thinking, when was the last time a younger person had gotten elected here? And um, I, my, you know, experience with working with the town in, in my lifeguarding role, and then I eventually worked my way up into the manager role there. Um, I got the experience to work more inside the town office. And through that role, I got to, you know, experience more of the municipal side of how the town operates. And so I think that was a key op opportunity for me to kind of feel like I had a little bit more to say. I had a little bit more experience. Um, I also have my degree in nursing. So I felt like that also gave me a little bit of an edge. But it was definitely a challenge. And um, did people bring I, it up at the door when you were knocking on doors and talking to people? Definitely. Yes, definitely. That was a conversation. I, I've, I had a couple interactions, mostly positive, but there was a couple interactions where um, that were really negative because of my age. And I was prepared for that. Um, I was prepared to, you know, that's part of it. And I, you know, to, if I'm being completely honest and frank, I, I never really expected that I was going to get elected. I kind of, what I had envisioned was that I was going to put my name forward and um, I would run in the election. I wanted to run a full proper election. I wanted to have a platform. I wanted to elevate politics in the town. And um but I really thought that maybe it wasn't going to be my opportunity to get elected this time. And I thought maybe this might inspire someone who's a little bit younger than me or the next generation below me to get inspired for the next municipal election. Um, it was a huge shock when I did get elected because um, it was, you know, a lot of work that I put into it, but it really was working against me of my age. And uh, I think in a way that that was probably what kind of helped me in a way too, but um, I focused my, my, um, my platform on, on youth and, and it really resonated, I guess. You have the unique ability, and I know we're, I was going to talk about the election here, but you brought up the fact that you were a staff for the town prior to your election. You have the unique ability for some who might not to be able to be on both sides of that table, be the person in the office compared to being the person behind the council table. When you decided to put your name forward, were you looking at it more from the perspective of a citizen or were you looking at it more of a perspective of a former staff member who knows the dealings of what's going on? Because as a former staff member for a municipality in Northern Alberta, I can tell you that whenever there was an election, everyone was like, who's going to run? Who, what, what staff member is going to run? So that way they can, our voices can be heard. So when you decided to run, were you looking at it more from a residential standpoint or a staff member standpoint? And I apologize to ask that question. It's just, it's a unique experience to have you on the show and talk about it like this. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think I, um, I think it would be unfair to say I only looked at it with one perspective and one lens, because I think that's one of the joys of being a politician is you get to look at every lens possible. Um, and so I would say that I did look at it from both lens, you know, as a resident of Devon, um, as a youth of Devon, 
as a um, as someone who worked in the town office. I got to kind of see all lens. I, I think, you know, it was a unique perspective because I also had relationships built in that town office, which it allows me to understand things. And I was able to quickly, I did my homework before running. I, I made sure I talked to the right people um, to try and understand what they believed would be the most important issues going forward. I think that was kind of what was really helpful for me when I was going to the door and knocking on the doors and and uh hearing from residents on what their issues were is I felt like I I kind of already understood some of those issues so I think I used it I used it to my advantage for sure so talking about the election and talking about door knocking and learning about what the issues are of your community it sounds like you have a pulse in your community you've worked for the town you're a nurse you're you also are now a counselor I can imagine you expect to know what you're going to hear at the door, whether it be local issues, micro issues, macro issues, or even provincial issues. But there's always those issues that come up that you don't always expect to hear, but you're always open to to talk about. Were there issues in your community when you were door knocking that you said, wow, I'm shocked that people are talking about this issue because I thought I had a pulse on the community? Yeah, I mean, I think... Yes and no. I okay. think the um, I felt like I I did have a good pulse on the community. I think the issues that were brought up that maybe surprised me on how the strength of their opinions was maybe more like the polarization almost. Um, a lot of and I guess this kind of you could even connect this back to a provincial election that's coming up very closely now. Is there were some people again who were very. Uh, one issue minded and and they voted on a one issue platform that's all that they cared about and so one question was are you going to abolish um photo radar in our community and to me that is an automatic no because there are some benefits to it for sure and um we have it in our community as a safety measure for around our playground and and uh school zones so i think that you know just by my response of saying no that was an automatic, you know, opt out. They're not going to vote for me. And uh, that's totally fine. That's their prerogative. But I felt like I re- I didn't I didn't think I realized how one issue some some individuals could be and that polarized polarization in our community that, you know, has kind of crept up. So um, I think that's that's a real interesting issue. You talk about the polarization. You ran in the last the last election in 2021 was heavily ran in the COVID-19 pandemic. And as a nurse, I can imagine it is hard because you want to balance the, the health measures against you, you, the, the desire to win in some sense, even though you openly were frank by saying you didn't expect to win, you ultimately did. How was that experience like? Because this is your first time being on the ballot in a general election while you might have run for student council. This is a whole new ball game municipally how was the experience in a COVID-19 pandemic election for you as someone who works in the health industry and has seen the inside of our hospitals yeah I think that's a really great question um I think it was challenging for sure I I have constantly said from the beginning before I even fully decided to submit my paperwork and such that I didn't want to lose myself in the process. And so I wasn't going to change my opinions based on, you know, the fact that I wanted votes. And so good on um, you, man. Good on you. (laughs) (laughs) I was that was that was something that was really important. And and you do see that in politics where people will change who they are. (laughs) People are weather vanes. What are you talking about, counselor? Bad. Come on. And that's not. That's not who I want to be. So, I um I I wanted to be very straightforward, and I did have conversations about COVID and um, the measures that our community took, and uh, whether I supported them or didn't support them, and and those situations. But honestly, I think that in a way that almost surprised me too. I had really good conversations with some residents on opposite sides for me and they 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 we had a conversation about it and that was what I will always do I I've never told my friends if they have a different opinion than me I never said I won't engage with you on a conversation because I think again that's how we get polarized is we don't have conversations about it so I'm willing to have a conversation but 
I want you to know when I'm when I'm writing, this is my values. And so uh, if you don't want those values um, to be represented on your town council, then don't vote for me. <laughs> um, and so I think it was a pretty uh, unique opportunity for sure to be in the height of COVID um, in, in some respects. Um, actually, in a lot of respects, that was actually during that time, it was some of the worst that I had dealt with. Um, so, and so it was very challenging in a lot of ways. Ultimately, though, in October, the last, the last, second last Monday in October, you get the blue check mark. You get the blue check mark beside your name that says you are now councillor elect for the town of Devon. At that moment, what goes through your head once you get con uh, uh, informed or notified that you've been elected to sit at town council? What goes through your head? Um, there was <laughs> a lot of shock, to be honest. I mean, I, um, in the last few weeks of the election uh, or the campaign, I guess, um, I had kind of started getting a feeling that I might have the opportunity of actually getting elected. There was different candidates who had come up to me and started, um, you know, congratulating me even before the end. <laughs> and um, I also had um, different municipal um leaders in our community uh, who started um, having conversations with me about presenting things at, that they would wanted to present on on issues in, in our you know future council meetings so it was almost as if they it was a foregone conclusion so I think that kind of stirred up a little bit of emotion there and then when I finally got the the notice that I got elected it was a huge shock and a lot of excitement but also a lot of responsibility I realized you know this is a a big role. I want to do it right. Um, and so there was, you know, it was a, it was a hard challenge in between um, here and then. <laughs> I've learned a lot. I've um, grown a lot and I've got still lots to grow and learn, but I've been, uh, it's been such an incredible opportunity. So I've been really fortunate and thankful. So I want to talk about that weight, that responsibility that you put on yourself, because no one else can put that responsibility and that weight of doing the job of a counselor correctly. But you are now deciding the impacts of your decisions of taxes, service levels, community organizations. How much of that weighs on you on a day to day basis that when you go into council meetings, you have to be aware that the decisions you're about to make are going to impact the people the next day. Because in municipal politics, things change on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not federal or provincial where it could take a month, two months, or even a year. Municipally is the next day. For you, how big of a responsibility and weight did you put on yourself? Um, I think initially... Um it was an unknown weight of responsibility. I didn't really know how much weight um, I had put on and I didn't know how much responsibility I had really actually just taken on. And I think it, it's been a discovering role of trying to realize how much role, how much power a municipal councillor actually does have in their community and you know the connections that they make on even a provincial level um, there's just so much weight and responsibility. I, I think I'm still discovering the extent of how much responsibility a counselor has in their community. Um, they you're, are... you're, you're almost two years into your first term, and I apologize to interrupt here, but I want to uh, jump into this question with this. What's been the biggest educational experience in this position for you? Because there are other people who are just in their first 100 days, almost 200 days of being elected, whether they be the same age as you, whether they be twice the age of you, all across this country who have just gotten elected municipally. What is the biggest educational experience that you've had? And what advice would you give these new counselors who are going through the same thing that you just went through? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. I think, um, I'm throwing all the interesting questions at you, Ben, because you're an interesting guy and I, I'm fascinated with your story here. That's why I wanted to get you on the show. Oh, thank you. Um, hmm, uh, what has been the most educational? I, I don't what did, know. What's the biggest thing that you learned about the job? Because from the outside, you might think you know the job, but once you get elected, it is something completely different because it is a, 
a beast on itself. And while you might be a part-time counselor pay wise, you are a full-time counselor because you can't go to the grocery store without getting stopped or talked, asked about, Hey, what about this issue? And what about this issue? So for you, has that been the educational experience of knowing that you have to be on 24 seven as a counselor when you're out in public? Hmm. I think that definitely is a component for sure. I, I think it's, again, it's interesting because I I did have the, that inside lens in a, in a way uh, that I felt like I did understand that the counselor's role is always all the time. And I think I realized that because, you know, past counselors, I had to have the opportunity to chat with some of them being in my manager role. And um, that was really enlightening. I think I didn't, maybe I didn't realize how important your connections with your provincial counterparts are um, and to have connections with them if you can. And we've, you know, we've talked, we've used our MLA several times um, to help advocate for different issues that are pressing in, in the town. And that's been really effective and, and beneficial for our town. We're, we've haven't fully seen the outcome of some of those um, conversations yet, but we're hopeful. <laughs> and <laughs> Um, I think that, you know, I think that's important. We've, we, you know, applying for grants, we've reached out to um, our MLAs, our MPs to be a part of those conversations. It's important to have those connections. And um, I've been really fortunate to have many, many conversations um, over the last year and a half here um, with my MLA and my MP. And they're both fantastic people and have, um, invoked a lot of interesting conversations, some of them about COVID, um, and then some of them about other things. So it's been it's been a really interesting time. And so I think that that's been really good. What I would tell someone if in their first 100 days what to do and everything is, I think I, I, I try to, you know, be as involved as possible at the beginning. And I was really thankful that you know, I, I'm not someone who won't say something if if I don't think it, but I also am someone who, if I don't have anything to say, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to fill space and avoid. So um, I think it's important at meetings to be efficient and, you know, time sensitive, of course. But if I really believed that there was something that was a pressing issue or I didn't understand something, I spoke up and I said it. And I really think that it's important that we all take like good governance takes time. And so if you want to be good and, and, and democratic, then I think you need to speak up, say your voice. What does good governance mean to you? I think it means um, ensuring that all voices are said and heard. It means weighing options, um, making sure that, uh, the best decision can be made with the information that's presented. And I really believe that, you know, in Devon, we, we do a, an exceptional job at that. Um, I really am proud of that. But um, when I get frustrated is when um, I feel like things are trying to get sped through just for time's sake. And I'm never someone who's, I, I you know, I would, I'll stay to a council meeting till 3am in the morning, if that's what it takes. Like, <laughs> I've never had a time limit on council meetings. Some some councillors might disagree, um, but I've never had a time limit on it because I feel like, you know, that's what we're paid to do is to sit there and have those conversations. So um, sometimes they go in loops. And so that's, you know, a different, a different conversation. But I think that we need to have the conversations. So to be cautious of time for you, because I know you are a busy person, I want to turn to my next segment. And this is about the town as a whole. And before mm -hmm. I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not a direction of council. This is his opinion. Councillor, in mm -hmm. your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the town of Devon as of recording this? You know, I think that's a really um, intriguing question in a lot of ways. I think, again, yes, this is my opinion. So that's uh, kind of sets this question apart in a lot of ways. I think for what I see as a pressing part for Devin is we have a lot of things that we're dealing with right now. Um, 
Devon was the only community in the Edmonton region that had negative growth in the last census. It was like 0.5%, but it was still negative growth. And uh, that was um, a stain on our community in a way. And uh, we are also a community that, um, so we haven't had much growth. And then that means we haven't had a lot of investments in our community. Um, the last previous council had kind of set the building blocks for growth um, and for investments in our community. And then this council has kind of picked up on those and, and really, you know, jumped off the diving board with it. So I think, in a lot of ways, I think the most pressing issue has been finances in a lot of ways, because we have had, um, we're under constraints that other communities might not have had, because with explosive growth comes a lot more revenue. Um, we haven't had that same opportunity. So we're trying to create revenue almost by, you know, um, applying for grants. And we were really successful. We had um, out of an $18.5 million um, twenty of an arena which that cost just ballooned throughout COVID with inflation and such so that was really unfortunate but um with that uh 18 and a half million 13 and a half of it was funded provincially and federally um the other amounts were um through other means that we've we've had to that we found money through so you know it's it's been incredible that um the town has been able to utilize those resources to kind of bring 18 and a half million dollars into our community that could have been going to another community, which uh, is really fantastic for Devon residents. We also have recently submitted an application for um, another grant for our permanent location of our library. Right now we're renting and uh, we've got an opportunity if this grant is fully realized and if the council ends up moving forward with on it, um, that we could start saving money actually because what we're spending on rent could be put towards um, debt uh, and that would be a permanent location. Um, and so, and there would be no changes in that rent, right? Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunities there. So, but finances is definitely uh, a constraint. We have to, you know, balance that with the residents in town who who can't afford huge tax increases. We've also, um, I, I don't know if you've heard, but yesterday it just came out that um, the, uh, uh, or the federal government announced that they were going to not, um, subsidize or um, the RCMP uh, announcement that basically levies a lot of uh, that uh, increase in funding and back pay for RCMP officers onto smaller rural municipalities or municipalities as a whole. Yes, exactly. And that's like devastating for so many communities. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, I think Devin's in, a, in an okay situation right now, but it will affect tax rates. Um, it will have to go up. Um, and that is really concerning that we have to be the ones who bear the brunt of that, considering that we weren't the ones who were sitting at the table negotiating that contract. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of, you know, financial constraints on every municipality, but I would say that for Devon in specific, that's what I would think is the most pressing issue. So well, I want to dissect some of these for a second, and I want to start with the overarching one, and that is finances. You're right. Things are getting tough out there. Cost of doing business is going up. Uh, inflation is causing a lot of impact. How are you, as councillor of the town of Devon, working with your fellow council members and the mayor, we're, how are you working with them to ensure that the services and the growth that is needed for your community doesn't all come on the backs of the residents. Because while it's great to apply for grants, you can't be 100% certain you're going to get every grant that you apply for. So you have to be cautious of what you do and how you grow. So when you were going through this last budget, I'm not sure if it's currently passed or if it just passed or if you're still waiting for the provincial money, how do you see yourself in your role balancing the needs of the residents against the needs of the growth of the community. Yeah, so this has been um, an important part of our three-year fiscal framework um, that we uh, put forward in the last budget, so for this upcoming year. Um, and so we did approve that back in November, but it is the focus of it is really trying to um, 
spread out our tax increases over several years with planned tax increases so that residents can anticipate what it's going to be um, three years down the road next year and the next year after that. So I think that that's been a big part of what we've tried to do. Um, it is, we, in our last budget, we um, really nitpicked the budget on every single line item, so much so that it was hundreds of dollars that we were talking about. And we we would talk and we would really negotiate it because we know that those that money means something to someone and it and it really lines up for you know you talk about that for $300 or something like that that eventually if you keep doing that it builds up to something else so um we recognized that that was an important part. And so we we spent the time during budget to really make sure that we were creating a fiscal framework that was realistic, that was doable. The town, previous town councils have been really reliant on pulling from our reserves, um, from our stabilization reserves to kind of offset tax increases because at that time, you know, it was, I understand, you know, we were in 2012 and we were in, you know, an economic downturn in Alberta, but um, we need to get off of that bandwagon of, of just using our reserves to supplement. So we've um, been pulling even more this, this coming year, but next year um, we're going to start replenishing the reserves. And so uh, that's a big part of what we're trying to get back onto is becoming a more fiscally viable community um, and, and making it in the three year stretch. So it's it's challenging. It's it's difficult because there's still a lot of unknowns we didn't we didn't accommodate or um, think about with this uh, RCMP cost. So that's you know that's a new conversation that we're going to be having in the next few weeks here. Um, but I think you know that's that's what every community has to deal with, unfortunately, right now. You talk about community, and I want to ask this question because I always find it fascinating what I hear from counselors like yourself. If I go talk to 100 people in your community, they're going to give me a list of needs and wants that they believe are the most important for their community. You as counselor have to take those issues that residents come to you with, whether it be potholes or park upgrades or sidewalks or better access at the pool, better access at the field track. And I'm, I'm just guessing these are some of the issues that you've probably heard about over the last few years, but you need to take them and look at them at budget time and say, how do we impact the most without feeling like people are being left behind? Because everyone pays their taxes. They should all pay their taxes, hypothetically speaking. They all want the their their needs and wants addressed. How do you as counselor address the individual needs? Hmm. Yeah, that is... Uh, or do you even call. look at it that way and look at it more as a town need and want compared to an individual need and want? Well, it's 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 challenging because, you know, I, I will say this right from <laughs> last 20 years or something like that, this community has always wanted an indoor pool. Um, we only have an outdoor pool, which is like well utilized during the summer. It, it's actually a regional thing people from Edmonton travel to Devon for our outdoor pool. But with that being said, we can't afford to sustain. And I know that because I know the numbers. I've I've lifeguarded at other communities. I've been involved in those, those numbers. I understand this community cannot support an indoor pool. Um, but that is what is number one on everyone's list. And when I went door knocking, that was what people brought up as their concern or is that their number one want. And, and I think that's fine. And, and, and I, I support that in a way too, because I say, you know, not in my, my term of this next, you know, not my four year term, but I'm like, maybe we can work towards that. Like, how do we get a community to a spot that is sustainable enough that we can support that? And so that's kind of my goal over this, like my time here in, in the town council is to try to build our community to get to points where we can sustain the ideas and the wants and the desires of our community um, while balancing also again you know I also heard people don't want a big city they don't want Devon to become a huge city they want it, do you have nimbyism be... in your town sorry do you have nimbyism in your town the not in my backyard I want everything to stay the same I don't want growth I want I want the small town feel and I want to keep the community the way it is because I'm hearing that a lot from a lot of counselors across Canada right now. Definitely. Oh, for sure. Like that is definitely a concern. Like that's definitely some things that I've heard a lot 
through throughout. But then, I mean, there's also the people who will say the complete opposite, right? So, I mean, there's there's the whole that balance again. I think that's the hardest part is trying to balance individual needs with the community needs with what is actual reality and what we can actually do. Um, and I think that that is, I, I, you know, every council meeting, what I go in with is I do my research beforehand. I do as much as I can to prepare for the council meeting, but then I also look over my um, five priorities that I was elected on. And I try to make sure that my decisions um, that I make in those council meetings line up with what my priorities were. And so that, that way there's no big surprises. And of course, you know, all, not all of my priorities were lined up with what decisions I'm going to be making, but I do my best to try and make sure that it lines up with the values of what people would have elected me on. Um, and some of those decisions will contradict, like again, photo radar. It will contradict maybe what the community wants. Maybe the community does really doesn't want photo radar, but I cannot in good conscience vote against that because I see the benefits. I see that are we know we have to protect um, a vulnerable population. So the challenges of that is is real. I want to turn to a new segment that I've started introduced in this new uh, uh, series that I'm putting together with 25 uh, counselors. And I want to know from you, I want to talk about the word apathy. There is a big, big apathetic undertone in municipal politics across this country. Provincially, people are engaged. Federally, people are engaged. For you, do you see an apathetic municipal politics government undertone in the town of Devon? And how do you combat it if you see it? Yes, uh, apathy is real in municipal politics, and you will see that based on our um, election results and the number of people who came out to vote. Um, I will say, though, if you look in the region, Devon did have one of the highest. Uh, Devon is quite municipally engaged, shockingly. So when um, you go ask questions of your community, people will actually give you their input? Yeah, I mean, uh, relatively, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on your graph. Um but I think, you know, like in our last election, we had um, 18 or 19 candidates who were running for six seats on council. I think that alone just tells you how like municipally engaged we were. Um, we have, uh, you know, when I went door knocking, people were willing to talk and they had conversations. Now, again, like photo radar or, you know, I want to see lower taxes and stuff like that. There's challenges in, in you know, accommodating those things but um i think people are engaged but there's only really seem to be engaged around election time and then it seems like the apathy really builds up again and i think that's been one of my challenges is um to try and keep people engaged how do you keep people engaged in our community politics to make sure that you keep myself accountable but also the other counselors at the table and the, and the mayor accountable for our decisions and I think a lot of what I do is I, I when I go out into the community, um, when I'm going for you know milk at the at our local IGA, or if I'm doing whatever I'm doing, and and someone stops me and talks, like I will ask them what did they think about so and so issue. I'll bring it up, and so that way it kind of reinvigorates the conversation and um, and possibly spreads that information around. Uh, I think it's important for us to keep talking about it. Um, and apathy is very real, but we can only do what we can do. Are people willing to listen, though? Because uh, in my time in municipal government, not municipal politics, but government, I notice that people want to be able to explain their side and don't want to hear the uh, like the what you have to say. They just want people to listen to them. For you, how much is how how important is it to be a listening ear, but also a talkative person as well because you need to balance what you hear against what you say so how do you balance that when it comes to apathy because people want to be heard you need to listen to them but you also need to tell them what your stance is on these issues and be respectful that their their opinion may be different from your stance yeah uh that's interesting yeah i i would say it depends on the environment that we're situated in there are some really engaged citizens 
um, and they will come out. <laughs> what do you mean social media is like that? People on social media are just a lovely bunch of people from what I understand. <laughs> <laughs> when they when they speak, they want to be heard, right? Um, but I think that's what's been interesting is uh, even at our council meetings, when there's been issues that have been brought up, people will constantly you know, send emails or come to council meetings bringing up the similar issues. They they need to be heard. I think that's the important part about a human nature. Really, is we all need to feel heard in order to eventually, hopefully, listen to the other side. Um, so I want that side to feel heard, but uh, that that I need to be able to listen first. Um, so sometimes the conversations end with me not really saying much. I will just you know take what they're saying, and I need to process it too. I never, I've, I've said this to many residents in town, um, that my opinion, my, my vote is never made up until sometimes literal little seconds right before I put my hand up or I don't put my hand up. It is, it's challenging to go and always be in that flux state of not always having a set vote, but I want to be able to hear all sides and all perspectives before making my, my decision. And so I think it's important to make sure that we can hear all sides. And yeah, I think it, with that question was relating almost to more of an engaged side. Versus How do I want to pick up on what your statement there, because it's a question I've asked a few other people as well. And it's a fascinating thing that you just brought it up. It's you have to be educated on both sides of every issue that's in front of you. When it when you get the agenda package, you have like from Friday to whatever day your council meeting is, or whenever the agenda comes out to when the council meeting is, you have a short turnaround time. So you have to be engaged. You have to know what's going on, but you also have to take what administration has told you. So for you, you just said, and it's a fascinating thing you just said here, you don't make up your mind until that hand is raised. So you are open-minded until like both sides have said every, all their piece. And then once the vote is called, then you've made up your mind. How important is it for you to do that? Because I can imagine that would stress the hell out of me, pardon my French, but it would stress me out not knowing what I'm going to vote on because people are always asking your opinion when you're at the grocery store, how are you going to vote this way? And you have to tell them, I don't know. What do you think I should do? Is that how you have to work it out? I mean, there's definitely leanings and I, I will always be honest about that too. I will say I'm leaning towards this way, but um, there have been times when, and and I've, I've voted a certain way because I've also in, ensured, I want to make sure that, you know, I think it's important that everyone's voice feels heard. And you, you, you said that so perfectly that it's important to, um, it's a quick turnaround. So you, you really do need to have a pulse in the community because you can't always just instantly get feedback um, within those few short days. And sometimes I will be working my nursing job in between that that time of the the um, the agenda going out on Thursday night and I'm reading through it furiously towards then on um, Monday morning or Monday evening, I have to go and 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 make a vote. And that can be really challenging. I will say too, like, I think this council has, um, we have good discussions, we have good um, questions that we ask of administration. I believe that we, you know, if we need to delay a vote, we will delay a vote too. Um, we've tried to engage community, the community as much as possible, I will do my best to engage the social media um, as much as I possibly can before, you know, a vote if I feel that I'm not really sure what the pulse is yet. But ultimately, again, I have to always go back to my foundation, my, um, my uh, principles that I got voted on. And those are really what I constantly go back to. And that actually gives me a lot of peace, um, knowing that my vote, if as long as it lines up with those, I can, I can feel rest assured that I felt like I made the right decision. Um, but with that being said, there's decisions that we can always go back on. And so I really encourage the community and any community, really, if you don't agree with the decision that's been made, make your voice heard because decisions can always get reversed. Um, so I think it's important to engage constantly because decisions can always be reversed.
I want to turn to my last segment because I'm very cautious of time. And I just realized that we're at almost at the 45 minute mark. And I told you 45 minutes. So hopefully you have five minutes to stick around to talk about tourism. I want to talk about tourism because I love tourism and I'll be in the town of Devon later on this year to visit some of these tourist destinations that you're about to tell me. So for my listeners who are across the country and around the world and people who are watching this via YouTube because our algorithm sucks there, but hopefully we're getting some gaining some traction there. What are some of the tourist destinations in your community that people need to check out if they visit the town of Devon? Oh my goodness, there's so many. I I really think, you know, Edmonton Edmonton has a, a more global perspective or a more international perspective in a lot of ways because they're our capital city. But uh, I think what people don't always realize about Devon is that we're like a miniature version of Edmonton in a lot of ways. We have a river valley that sneaks right through our community and uh, we have lots of small businesses. We've got that White Ave perspective. Edmonton has a White Ave that's very central, that has tons of small businesses. We've got that in Devon. Um, we've got a, a boat launch that um, people travel from all around the region to use our boat launch. We have um, festivals that go on in our community. We've got a Devon Fest festival, a music festival that I think this is now the third or fourth year that it's running and it's going to be happening down in our Voyager Park right in the in the River Valley. And it's a gorgeous setting. Um, and it's it's just fantastic how our community has so many different um natural elements to it. We're a, you know, a community for the summer, but we're also a community for the winter. Um, we've got our light, our, um, our uh, Devon golf course that is apparently it's, I, I don't golf, so, <laughs> but apparently it's well known in the golfing community and people do travel for this, this golf course. We've got a Devon uh, Lions campground, which is, if you haven't been there, you've got to go there because um, it's got some of the most beautiful trails, but it's also just a very lively atmosphere, especially in the summer. Um, it's got a beautiful boardwalk uh, right along the river Valley. Um, I just love the natural elements that we have. We're also connected to the River Valley Alliance, which is a river trail system that connects Devon to Fort Saskatchewan. And uh, it's still in the, you know, growing. It's it's not finished yet, but uh, we've got some trail systems that are being built and, and it goes snakes along that river valley. It's the Battery Creek. I would say like if you search Battery Creek Trail, um, it's got some of the most beautiful panoramic views of the river valley. Um, I just think our trail systems are, are a, a huge gem and a huge asset. We've got snowshoeing and and um, fat bike. We've got um, uh, cross country. Got, it sounds like you have something for everyone. I have something for you and for everyone. <laughs> I think if you tell me what your interests are, I could find an activity for you. I think the thing that's so interesting is I, I bring up Devon to so many of my friends around the around the region. And I think a lot of them didn't realize how much Devon had to offer until they either had conversations with me or even during COVID um, when we really couldn't travel much. So then Devon became swarmed and almost too much like some residents complained about how many people were in town um but it was really good for a lot of our small businesses here we've got a summer market series that um was actually a motion that i had put forward and and it's just now that this is our second year coming up this um this year and uh, it's uh, small businesses farmer markets it's huge um i think there's so much for Devon to offer into the region but also you know hopefully more provincially and i i feel like our proximity to the airport is a huge asset too. So uh, we're only 15, 20 minutes away. So I think, you know, there's so much to offer. Uh, I just really hope that people really utilize it. Well, I'm looking forward to visiting later on this year, probably in the next month or so, actually. But I want to ask the question that is the million dollar question, the overarching question. And this is the most important one of this entire episode. What makes, in your opinion, the town of Devon such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Hmm. Um, I think, you know, Devon, our, our motto is that we're a healthy, active, sustainable, and inclusive community. And I think if you could pull anything as a key message from everything that I've said today, I think you could pull in that we're healthy, we're an active, we're sustainable, and we're an inclusive community. I think all of those things together create a community that is um, 
one worth living in. And I think that we have the small town atmosphere. We're very close to um, the city. And we're actually close to Spruce Grove, which is another city, Leduc. We're close to Edmonton. Uh, we're close to even St. Albert. Um, we've got everything at our fingertips. And yet you still have the small, quaint, small town feel that you would hope for if you moved into a small town. So I think the Devon is um, everything you could ask for and more. So, Councillor, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this today. It was greatly appreciated. And again, I look so forward to visiting the town of Devon later this year. So thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Reach out when you're here and I would love to show you around too. <laughs> Certainly will. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least 15 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy and helps us be a better people. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And this has been the Crossboard AMG News with Chris Brown. And remember, just keep talking.